Hey, Troy here with Lithogen. I'm here today to talk about the Noggin 100 Ultra. One of my customers had a bit of questions for it, so I am going to go over the device. One of the main advantages of sensors and software equipment is how modular the devices are. The Noggin has a number of different antennas you can put on it and a number of different ways you can mount it. This particular unit is configured in the smart toe configuration. That means that it has the handle attached, the odometer wheel at the back, the skid plates under the antennas so you can pull it over uneven ground, and the DVL, which you use to look at the data while you're collecting at it, is mountable on a harness with a belt battery pack. This allows you to pull the system through fairly rugged terrain and it works fairly well. Uh, we're going to go take it outside and tow it around in the snow a little bit later just to see how it performs. The antenna mount here, it's actually a Lithogen custom item, is holding a Geo GPS. This GPS is the GPS we recommend you pair with the device. It has about a 30 centimeter accuracy uncorrected. There's an internal battery and a one power button operation. GPS signal goes via serial cable to the back of the console where it just accepts the standard uh, strings that are coming off the GPS. The odometer wheel here kind of flexes, so if you're over uneven ground, it should hug the terrain. You just want to make sure that where you're strapping the odometer cable on, it has enough play so that the odometer cable doesn't get under tension. The odometer cable is fed in here at the main noggin cable, and this is the noggin 100 Ultra unit here. It's got a transmitter and receiver antenna. I don't actually know which one is which because they're interchangeable. Uh, this is an unshielded antenna, so it's ideal for use in areas where there are not a lot of other things that can cause radio reflections. Uh, for example, you want to avoid parking lots full of cars, fences, overhead power lines, that's etc. You can still survey in those areas, but you just have to be aware that you're going to get those reflectors in your data. The customer that we're doing this video for is going to be surveying on top of a glacier where an unshielded antenna is just fine. Reroute the cables up the handle, and that's just to prevent tension on the cables. If you're running this with one person, usually the person pulling the instrument will also be the person that is operating the screen. That means the cables need to be uh, run up the handle. If you're running it with two people, often you'll have one person that's just maneuvering the instrument and another person operating the screen with the harness and the battery. That's useful in particularly challenging terrain where uh, extra maneuvering is required and maybe lifting and, and pushing things about. Okay, the next video, I'm gonna strap this on and go outside and we're going to see what it looks like being towed. Okay, I'm just firing the system up here and we're gonna tow it around a little bit. You can see even on this metal surface here, it goes and moves pretty well. Obviously this is going to be a little bit different in the snow, so uh, we're going to head over to the snow and see how it goes over there. It's already turned on, but it's still detecting the sensor. There it goes. So I'm going to go line scan. I'll leave it at all the default settings. Just going to hit start. And it won't actually start showing data here until the odometer starts moving. So I'm going to start towing. You can see the data come in. I'm going to go zip around the snow.
that went pretty well. Um, the data looks reasonable. These lines right here are the reflections off the fences uh, and probably the car. So that is obviously an effect of the unshielded antenna. But it uh, towed pretty nicely in the snow. The, if you get too close to zero degrees, what's going to happen is on that wheel, there's going to be a buildup of sticky snow. Today it's about minus 10, and so the snow isn't very sticky. And it's working great. Back inside, waiting for it to dry. If you're tearing it down outside in the snow, the important thing is to make sure moisture doesn't get in this connector as you're disconnecting it. That's probably the number one source of problems. Everything else is pretty moisture resistant and the snow can more or less just melt on the instrument. I'm gonna let it do just that and then I'm gonna pack it up and take a look at it. This is, I recorded while I was walking into the shop so the data is actually just crap because it's all the metal shelves and stuff. And we're packing it up. These are all the components laid out that would ship. These are still wet from our test outside, so they are drying out. We won't package them until they're done. Some things here that you didn't see in the test. There's a dongle here with Echo Project on it. There's some charging cables for the GPS. There's a spare battery. We always ship two batteries, two chargers, uh, just in case things go sideways. This is how small it would pack down if you were to repack it for a helicopter or something like that. Um, obviously, we use a lot of shipping foam and things like that when we're gonna send it to customers. Finally, the fully packed version. I managed to get it into two boxes for shipping, which avoids having to use the giant crates there's some smaller boxes inside this one. So both batteries and chargers would go in there. The DVL and GPS and stuff will go in there. Uh, it'll get filled with foam, just so nothing moves around in there. But uh, everything else is just the loose components. Inside here is the 100 megahertz antenna and electronics, plus any of the longer skinny component, uh, components like the handle. A short video addendum talking about the Noggin 100 Ultra in the context of GPR surveying on glaciers. Um, glaciers are very, very deep and you can see very deep into them with GPR. One of the side effects is that when you set your depth on the Noggin, it maxes out at 50 meters and clearly with 100 megahertz, you can see past 50 meters. So you kind of have to take a step back, let's go back to the defaults here, and look at this from first principles perspective. The depth here actually doesn't matter. What really matters is your time window here. So this is how many nanoseconds it's gonna record the trace before it starts the next trace. You can play with this a little bit, by adjusting either the depth or the velocity settings. So we're going to use the ice setting here and then go back. And you can see that the time window has changed here due to the ice setting. If we set it to the maximum depth on ice, we're looking at 665 nanoseconds. This is a reasonable estimate for <clears throat> if you wanted to see 50 meters through ice. Now on a glacier, if you want to see 100 meters, you want to make sure your time window is at least double that. So we're going to screw around setting some arbitrary velocities to see if we can get that to double. First thing you'll notice is, well, we have 0.15 and 0.08, so I'm going to pick that one. And immediately you see our time window has doubled, although our depth hasn't. What this means in principle is on a glacier, you're now seeing 100 meters because the time window is large enough to see 100 meters. If you want to push past 100 meters, you go into velocity and you start 
eh. pushing it down. So like this is now about 150 meters in your time window for glacier ice velocity. You can ignore this and also when you're surveying you're going to have a depth uh, ruler on the side of the screen and that depth ruler is going to be wrong. Uh, all of your depths are going to be misreported by about a factor of three. So this is how you sort of trick the system into recording this depth on the glacier. When you bring it into the software to do post-processing, you'll change this velocity back to 0.15. Uh, or if you have some other calibration info, like a borehole through the ice or something like that, then you could actually directly calibrate it. But 0.15 is the perfect velocity for glacier ice usually. Okay, that's all.